Hello, I'm Carl Seibert. Welcome to part two of our series on preparing images for the web, optimizing them, if you will. In part one, we demonstrated the whole workflow, which only took a couple of minutes, frankly, and then we talked in pretty great detail about using the software and step-by-step -step going through the process of evaluating our images. Now in part two, we're going to talk about determining what we need to do to these images to make them work properly on our website. And then we'll configure XNView's batch convert function to take care of that for us, basically in one click. Now the second half of our lightning processing of these photos was configuring the photos themselves to the specs that we wanted, saving them out, and uploading them to our website. And this is probably the exciting part of this process. If you came here by Google, this is probably what you were looking for, folks. Many people talk about optimizing photos for the web, and there's been a great deal of ink spilled on this particular subject, hours of videos recorded. And the reality is nowadays, it's the summer of 2018 as I record this, that preparing pictures for the web, quote unquote optimizing them, just isn't the big thing that it once was. It's a really different world. The reality is that in the 2018 world, most websites, and this will include all WordPress websites, all Drupal websites, all Joomla websites, most custom-built websites, most e-commerce platforms. Basically, just about every website in the world needs to have a series of images at differing sizes available so that it can serve them to different devices and meet their requirements. You don't want to serve an enormous photo to a tiny little phone that's only a couple or 300 pixels wide, and vice versa. So what happens is you upload an image to the website, and then the website itself renders out those smaller stair-step size versions of the image, compresses them, and saves them according to its own settings. So we are no longer actually making the files that are going to get served to our visitors on our websites. The first step on this journey is going to be doing a little bit of research and finding out how our website works. And that's down to what sort of CMS we might have on our website, whether it's WordPress or whether it's something else. And it's also down to how we run our own website. And the first question is, what happens to that original image that we upload to the website? Is it going to be served at all to anybody, or is it only going to be served sometimes? If your website takes the photo that you upload to it, uses it, makes its renditions, and then throws it away, that takes all the strain out of the game for you because your only responsibility at this point is making sure that the picture that you upload to the website is good enough in quality to get the results that you want, that you've programmed your website to do for you. In other words, you almost don't have to do anything at all. You could just take the file, and if it's good, just upload it, because access file size is not really going to hurt you that bad. It's going to chew up bandwidth and it's going to chew up a little bit of processor time, and then poof, it's going to be gone. Now, in WordPress's case, and in the case of a number of CMSs, the file that you actually upload is potentially going to be used. And if that's the case, the next question is, what is it going to be used for and how often? And in the case of my website, which is a WordPress website, the answer is that it is rarely served. It will only be served when someone clicks on a picture to see the quote-unquote full-size picture, to see the media file 
in WordPress parlance. And that's expected behavior on a lot of websites. A lot of websites default behavior is you see a picture, you click on the picture, you get to see a large view of the picture. That means for my website, the requirements for an uploaded image are first that the image has enough quality to give the image processing library in my CMS what it needs to work with. Second, that the image be an appropriate size to fill that role of what's shown when someone clicks to see the large version of a picture. And third, since it's going to live on my server, it just can't be too enormous because it's just going to take up too much server space. I suppose there is some page load concern about how long it takes to display that photo when somebody clicks on a photo like that. But that isn't much of a concern because a person doing that is not in the mood to demand instantaneous response. I mean, let's face it, unless the picture is enormous, it's going to load in a half a second or so anyway. So that's not a real big worry. The main things for me are just server space that it takes up and making sure that I give the image library enough to work with. Now, other people are going to be in a position where the image that they upload is going to be served routinely. It's going to just be the largest image in that ladder of images. If that's the case, you're going to be making the same trade-off with slightly different emphasis. You're going to want to make the file as small as you can because that's going to directly affect page load time. But on the other hand, you still have that same requirement that what we're really doing here, our first priority, is providing enough quality for the website to do its own image optimization for us. And while we're at it, while we're standing on this precipice, staring out at the horizon and contemplating things, and by the way, folks, have you noticed that my cursor is sitting on a wicked sensor spot on this particular photo. So I suppose I should retouch that at some point. Anyhow, so while we're standing here, staring at the horizon and thinking about prerequisites, let's talk for just a second about that imaging library on your website while we're at it. It's pretty important since we're taking all this effort to make sure that we get our metadata right and that we do the right thing that we don't destroy it when we publish it. For most CMSs and most websites, what that means is making sure that you have ImageMagick selected as your imaging library on your website, rather than GD, which is, generally speaking, the other choice, and that ImageMagick is configured correctly. Now, this latter consideration applies more to people with big, fancy, custom-built, one-off websites, than it does to people who use off-the-shelf CMSs because where JPEGs are concerned, the defaults for image magic are just peachy keen fine with regard to preserving metadata. Then there is the default that is set in your CMS for quality. Now, that's controllable in most CMSs. In Drupal, there is an interface for it, and you can just slide a slider just like you do in an image editing program. And in WordPress, if you don't like the default, which, by the way, is a setting of 82 in quality, either for GD or for ImageMagick, and by the way, that setting is not consistent from program to program. There's nothing that says that 82 in X in view is going to equal 82 in ImageMagick. In any case, if you don't like 82, it's a few lines of code that you paste in a file. You can look it up on WP Beginner and they'll give you the code and quick instructions for how to do it. And you can change that setting to anything you want. So now, let's dismiss this staring at the sunset sort of thing. And let's get specific about doing this stuff in XN View. So in XN View, when we did this the first time, as you see, the way we did it is with the batch convert process in XN View even if we're only processing files one at a time. So we go to our right-click menu, and we choose Batch Convert. And as you can see when we did that, I'll close it and do it again. There is a keystroke, Command-U, 
Command U. There it is. And our batch convert dialog opens up. We see five tabs here. We're really only going to concern ourselves with two of them. In the Actions tab, there we go, we have obviously a before and after preview image on the right side, before tab and an after tab. There is no after because we haven't asked XNView to do anything yet. And in this column, we add a script by adding actions. In this particular case, we have an action that will manipulate IPTC metadata, followed by another IPTC metadata or another metadata action. This is the clean metadata action in XNView. And I use this a lot, getting pictures ready for the web. What we can do in this action is by ticking off these various things, we can simply delete them from the metadata. Probably don't want to delete the IPCC profile. However, the EXIF and the EXIF thumbnail can just easily be dispensed with. What happens if we want to preserve XF information? Like in that case where we had the copyright management information that was in the EXIF and appeared nowhere else, that's not where it's supposed to appear. It really should be in the IPTC if we actually expect people in the real world to see it. In any case, we can zap the thumbnails out of the EXIF and leave the rest of the EXIF data. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, we have the resize action in this particular stack. And what we do here is we set the bounding box that we want to resize our picture to fit in. And I've set 2048 by 2048. The mode fit does that. It does a bounding box. If you choose longest size and set 2048, that's exactly the same thing as fitting your picture in a 20 by 48 square bounding box. We have a couple of other checkboxes. Keep ratio is really important because that will preserve your aspect ratio. You certainly do not want your picture to get squished when you process it. And follow orientation is another thing. You really don't want uh, your picture to fall on its side when it's sundered from that EXIF orientation tag. And if the picture is saved right side up, by the way, that tag is no longer necessary. That tag is really important early in the workflow when pictures come out of your camera so that you're editing them right side up. But as soon as you save them out, no matter how you do it with XNView or Photoshop or any other program, you want to save them out right side up. And at that point, you never need to worry about that tag again. The reduce enlarge option here, you can just set to always. And if it has to enlarge a picture, it will. And you need to be aware of that. If you notice pictures that are slipping past you and they're being enlarged and you're losing quality and you were caught unawares, you can set this thing to only reduce and it'll stop the show at that point. You have a choice of resampling methods from a rather wide array. X in view is nothing if not configurable. I choose the default just to keep myself from going crazy. Each one of these things in this stack has its own little tick box to enable it or to disable it. And in order to put one in the stack, Let's go down to the bottom so that we make this easier, easiest on ourselves. We'll take resize out of here and we will add an action and we will go to image and we will go to resize and we will simply choose it. And it's going to pop that module back in our script stack. And we can just make sure that it is set to be the way we want it to be. Well, that's interesting. We somehow zoomed our preview. So we'll go back to the top. We see that we have our IPTC section turned off. Oh, and I suppose I should explain the way this works in this dialog is that anything is, that is blank is skipped over. That's backwards from most editors where if you leave a blank field in a template and you apply it, 
it will delete that field. In this particular case, if, for example, you wanted to add a custom copyright notice, you can just turn this dialog on, choose what you want to put in your copyright notice, and not worry about destroying an existing caption or existing byline or something like that. It would destroy an existing copyright notice in that particular case. Once you have everything arranged here as you want it to be, there is a save dialog, which we will pull up here so it doesn't fall off of the video. And it remembers its working folder. And you can simply save your settings with the name. And then thereafter, you choose them in the list. Now, you probably will end up making a bunch of different batches. You'll do perhaps batches that treat metadata differently, perhaps batches that do and don't strip the EXIF. Maybe you have batches that make photos at different sizes. There's all sorts of possibilities, but it's really pretty easy if you have pictures that need two or three different treatments to have two or three different batches ready to go and simply batch them off in two or three groups. The next important tab for us is the output tab. The top of the output tab asks you where you want to save your image, the usual kind of thing that you would expect to find in any batch processing uh, output settings. Now, in XNView, I will note here that if you save your photos back into the source folder, you run your batch as we did originally, and we saw that our new photos, the photos that we made with our batch, came back pre-selected. So it was just one more drag and drop stroke really, to upload them to our website. And that was really handy for us. File name. File name is a variable sort of a thing. Here we have it. In this particular case, we're going to name our file with its existing file name. This will be the base file name. XNView takes care of the extension all by itself. And the way this thing works is here we have a variable picker in a flyout. You might want to do a file name and let's say the dimensions of the picture as your batch saves it. So we will go over here to our variables picker. And this is actually a little bit tricky. And of course, it jumped off of the video screen. Is there anything I can do about that to fix that for you? No, I don't think so. So I went to saved image. Not to image, because that's the input image. Saved image is the output image. And I chose width. And I did it again. And you can see the first three letters. It'll be high. So I have width and height. And I'll put an X between them. And I'll put a dash in here just for the sake of it. And that'll give me the original file name by the pixel dimensions of the picture, .jpg. We have some options down here. The top two are about the folder structure for big batches of pictures where you're doing whole folders. Getting pictures ready for the web, it's gonna be onesies and twosies and sixes and eights, so we didn't even have to worry about that. The one of these that we do actually have to worry about is preserve metadata. We've gone to a lot of effort to make sure that our metadata is right. We don't want to destroy it here. And preserving the color profile is probably a good idea. That's the subject of a whole nother video, and it's really debatable. You can, at this point, mid-2018, you can't go terribly wrong either way with color profiles. If you don't pay any attention to them all at all, it will probably be fine. If you choose sRGB profiles, that'll probably be fine. And if you choose anything else, you probably do have to think about it. But we'll do a video on that someday. Format, output format. Everyone should have a copy of XNView because it's capable of reading 500 formats and heaven knows how many it can save, but it's really a lot. We're choosing JPEG 99% of the time when we're getting pictures ready for the web. JPEG is the thing to do. WebP and some of the new formats 
just really aren't completely baked yet. They're exciting, but we'll go there when the time is appropriate. We press this little settings button and we bring up right settings. Okay, here are your JPEG saving options and your compression options. We have the slider. Now, I told you that my website is a WordPress website. WordPress, by default, uses a quality setting of 82. And again, that's on ImageMagick. It doesn't necessarily correspond to here. But that gives me the between 82 and 100 as my options for compression. And I've basically found that I can be pretty aggressive. I can even go a little below 82, but that's not a good idea. We don't want to give the imaging library an image that's been compressed more than our output compression. It just doesn't make sense. And counterintuitively, it also is not going to make your output images any smaller. Overcompressing your input image that you upload will actually increase the size of your output image a little bit. Not tons, but a little bit. The reason for that is that compression artifacts are more difficult to compress than legitimate picture. So don't overcompress on this step. Don't fall into that temptation. And a good rule of thumb is just never go below the compression setting that your website is going to use when it optimizes your image. So we have some more JPEG options to choose. And the reality is there's really only two or three of these things that directly affect image quality. Reality also is that each one of those parameters interacts with each other and they all interact with the subject matter of the photograph. It is very nearly impossible to predict with any certainty with JPEG what settings are going to give you the image quality and file size that you really want. It's a trial and error sort of situation. And what we're going for here is a default that works well for us most of the time. We're going for sane, simple settings that we can use and not worry about. If we see them not working down the road, we'll just manage those exceptions. And that'll be the subject of another video, how you can intervene on your website for a particular picture where typically what's happened is the quality isn't up to spec. Or in some cases, what may have happened is that your file size is just too enormous. We have the option to make our file a progressive. Now, progressive JPEGs load in waves on a website. They come in as a low res, the next wave, they're a little bit better, the next wave, they're fine. And they work themselves up to full resolution. If your website saves progressives and you're using progressives on your website, fine, great, choose progressive. The chances are nine out of 10 that it doesn't. And you're not gonna make your final photos that are served to your visitors progressive by ticking this tick box. You're only making the one photo that you uploaded progressive. If in fact it's served, that one will work as a progressive. The others will work however the settings are set in your CMS. So in all likelihood, that's empty. Optimize Huffman table. Go ahead and tick it. Back in the old days, there were JPEG decoders that could not decode optimized JPEGs, but I haven't seen one of those in the better part of a decade. Once again, it's 2018. That's just so last century. Forget it. The DCT method, the direct cosine transform. Here we have a pullout. And by the way, in most programs, you just get a slider and one or two tick boxes for your JPEG options, and the program just chooses sane combinations of options. In XN view, you get to choose all of this stuff, which is very daunting at first. But when you realize, basically, you go through these things, you make sane choices the first time. And later, if you need to come back, you're only going to be modifying one or two things. So it's fine, and we can appreciate XN view's wonderful granularity in the control that it's giving us. 
even though we might not actually need this. So in any case, the DCT method, our choices are how fast or how slow our JPEG is compressed and saved. 20 years ago, when processors were weak, this might have been a thing. But seriously, nowadays, do I care if it takes an extra half a second to save my picture? No, I don't. So regardless of whether I'm going to compress aggressively or not, I just choose the best but slowest. Smoothing factor is kind of a JPEG setting for obsessives. Google it if you're interested in it. Experiment with it if you're interested in it. But otherwise, I just leave it at zero and don't worry about it. Subsampling factor, a.k.a. chroma subsampling. This is actually an important one. Your quality setting interacts with your subsampling setting and interacts with the subject matter in your photo to determine what the eventual outcome will be. Chroma subsampling can save a significant amount of file size, and in many files, you won't see much difference. In many continuous tone files that have kind of subtle colors, you can do quite a lot of chroma subsampling on pictures like that, and it's not going to hurt you. And you might even be able to make a trade-off against quality. More chroma subsampling, higher quality setting, you might get nicer looking results, and a slightly smaller file size. And you can experiment back and forth basically until you go crazy. Now, in my case, the only time that original uploaded file is served is when somebody clicks on a picture and they want to see a big, bright view of the picture. So I don't worry about it. I choose the best quality, the least amount of chroma subsampling, and I move on with life. If you're in a situation where your uploaded picture is going to get served a lot, this is a trade-off that you need to consider. And basically, you just need to experiment and see what works for you. So we also have some tick boxes here. We could rebuild the embedded EXIF thumbnail. Heavens no, we certainly don't want to do that. Use estimated quality when possible. Nah, I don't, I don't tick it. And these four are important. As I said, we've worked hard on deciding consciously what metadata we want to keep and what metadata we want to destroy. So we want to tick all four of these keep tick boxes. And I'll move my little cursor out of the way. And you can screenshot right here. And here is a beginning for you. Here's a template. Here's a starter template that you can use and then refine to your own needs to make your own default JPEG saving settings. Once you have what you want, you simply choose OK. And I suppose now really is the time when we should be saving this particular batch action. We want to make sure that we've saved these settings correctly into our batch action. And by the way, these settings are sticky. So if you adjust them, they're very likely to stay adjusted for the next session. So when in even the slightest little bit of doubt, go ahead and open this settings box up and take a look at what's in it. Because otherwise you could find that you've just saved a bunch of pictures at a quality level of, let's say, 10. And that's not going to be good at all. And how do I know that, you wonder? Yes, I have indeed done that. Now, we didn't talk very much when we were back here and we were setting our size. That's another one of those know your website, make your decision questions. I'm using 2048 pixels on the long side of my photo as my size. That's actually a very popular size for uploaded images going to websites. But I know a lot of people who use 1280. I know a lot of people who use 3000 if you're catering to high density displays like retina displays, you might want to make your photos bigger still. That's something that you should experiment with. Decide how it works best for you. Set a sane default and go on. And if you do down the line, have to make a one off change. It's going to be easy enough to make the change, save out one picture differently. So let's go ahead and close this. What if your website doesn't have a CMS? 
that's going to make those responsive design renditions, that series of ever smaller versions of your photo, for you. Well, what do we do then? Well, the thing that we would like to do then is we would like to ask XNView's batch convert function to sequentially make conversions and take care of all of those sizes for us in just one go. Unfortunately, batch convert in XNView doesn't work that way. However, what you can do, and let's just, we'll go through this here. We'll, we'll select these, some of these pictures. We'll take this one, and that one, that one, that one, and let's take cropped coffee cup man here, and we'll bring up our batch converter. Now, I have saved on my desktop a folder for the output from this operation. Now that does a couple of things for me. One is it's a tidy place to accumulate these files that I'm making. And the other thing that it does in XN view is it leaves the source file selected in the browser. If you save back into the same folder that you're already in, the selection will move to the output files, which is all handy if you just saved a few files and you want to upload them to your website. In this case, we're just going to use the batch converter to make one set of pictures and then go back and make another and then make another and do our sizes that way. So we have this folder, we have this folder saved ahead for that purpose. We have some pictures selected in our browser and we'll go down here and we will choose a batch conversion. Now I have this output folder saved into these batch conversions. So as long as I don't delete that folder and confuse things, it'll be right there. Now, mind you, if I want to go back and set this each time, XNView remembers last used folders or recently used folders. So it's not too much of a problem to do that. But we have our, fold, we have our photos selected in our browser, ready to go. And we have a place for them to go. And we have selected this batch, which is going to make 1,024 pixel wide renditions for us. We hit the convert button. And a few seconds go by. And now we can just change to the 500 pixel wide batch. Run it. And now we'll go back and we'll do some little bitty thumbnail size ones at 150. There we go. And if we go to our folder, our output folder that we made, here we have it. We have Beach Runner 150 by 100, 500 by 333, 1024 by 682, and so forth. We have three of him, we have three of the blue-eyed lady, we have three of coffee cup man, we basically have three of everything. So now all I have to do is select them and then upload them to my website. And there they are. All nice and neat in a directory on our website, ready to go. The idea here is that it's easy enough and it really only takes a couple of seconds more to go back, pull up the next size batch convert that you want to do, and hit the button, as opposed to twiddling your fingers while a script pulled up the next size batch conversion and hit the button for you. So that's all there is to it if you have to do the rendition thing manually. There it is. There is preparing images for the web. This is another one of those topics where we've had to invest pretty much time going in. This has been a long video and there is going to be some thinking and experimenting and default setting on your part before you can really use this information. But once you've done it, it's pretty matter, pretty much a matter of setting up a power tool, getting your photos in and letting it rip. The only part of the process that you're going to have to concentrate on is the part of the process that needs human attention. The part of the process where you're weighing the factors 
How much do you trust the client? Does this copyright notice look right? Those sorts of things we'll never be able to program a computer to do. But we can certainly program a computer in a heartbeat to strip the EXIF thumbnails, resize the photos, recompress the photos, and make everything ready so that we don't have to worry about it in a matter of 10 seconds or so. We can have all that mechanical work done and out of the way and move on to the next thing that we as human beings need to put creative effort into. And that is the whole idea of this, to allow us to be diligent and consistent and precise without taking effort away from the creative process, which is what we're doing this for in the first place. Once again, I'm Carl Seibert. Reach out in the comments or on social media. Tell us how you do this. Do you have a better way? If you want to do this in Photo Mechanic, I'm going to come back with a video that does this in Photo Mechanic, and I'll go through all of the same preliminary, philosophical, default setting sort of considerations that we went through here. So we'll see you again, and in the meantime, mind your metadata.